An instrument scans the surface of the panel using water and sound waves to probe for air pockets that could fatally weaken the wing. When we have a gap in the plies, the sound will not transmit through there well. George Bible's worst fears are confirmed. The skin is riddled with defects. Right, right now, I'm just, just exhausted. Just, we, we, we can't get a break. I mean, it's just downhill. So we'll have to do what we have to do to get a panel down to Palmdale as fast as we can. After hundreds of hours of work, the wing skin is worthless. With the first wing frame nearing completion down in Palmdale, Bible's team and its bold experiment are simply running out of time. Lockheed is facing a crisis of its own. The problem that has brought its entire assembly program to a grinding halt hinges on the holdup of a single crucial part. We can have 99% of everything it takes to assemble the airplane, but if there's one part that uh, hasn't been delivered yet and it's buried somewhere in the middle of the aircraft, you have to wait on the assembly work until that actually shows up. Like Boeing, Lockheed engineers have tried to save money by reducing the number of parts needed to build the plane. One part in particular, bulkhead 270, has ended up especially complicated. It will join the front of the plane, including the cockpit, to the fuselage. As a key piece holding the plane together, it's made of the metal alloy titanium. The combination of strength and lightness make it a natural choice for the bulkhead. But nobody at the Skunk Works had anticipated how hard it would be to carve such a complicated piece out of this super hard metal. Machining the 300-pound Lockheed part means whittling away at a solid five-ton slab, the drills running 24 hours a day, using diamond bit saws and a special lubricant to reduce heat. The pressure to get the bulkhead done is enormous, but so is the price of any mistake. If this part fails, it could almost ultimately be the end of our competition with Boeing in the JSF program. I mean, it would really set us back. On top of the crisis on the shop floor, bad money management threatens to get Lockheed fired from the competition. In a program in large part about affordability, the company admits it's $100 million over budget. Lockheed blames part of the overrun on a $30 million accounting error. In essence, uh, what it was is we were writing checks uh, without going back into the check register is what it amounted to. Lockheed, yes, had a, a problem in the subcontract management business in their manufacturing end at uh, Palmdale. It wasn't discovered till late. Very unfortunate, very disappointing. And the lesson there is take nothing for granted. It's a make or break point in the program. Under a powerful escape clause, the government can end the competition and award the fighter contract to Boeing. In the first real test of the military's commitment to fiscal limits, the JSF lets Lockheed off the hook. They're saved by the growing number of international customers now lining up to buy the Joint Strike Fighter. We've got Canadians, we've got Italians, we've got Danes, we've got Dutch, we've got a little bit of everybody. It ensures that for tomorrow in coalition warfare, we got partners with the same capability to fight the same wars as we do. Ending the competition early would be a domestic and diplomatic debacle. The government realizes that this program is so big and so influential on a national and, in fact, international level that their best bet is effectively to sweep this anomaly under the carpet let's forget about it and let's move on and let's work under the assumption that Lockheed has learned a lesson and they won't let this happen again. Although as disappointing as that was, the silver line there is we're doing business a lot, lot better and we'll continue for the future.
In the end, Lockheed gets slapped on the wrist for bad budget controls and presses on with the program, nearly a year and a half behind schedule. We can't let one minute go by without paying attention to something out on the floor and getting it done. We can't, we can't be slackers anymore. But back at Boeing, it's hardly been smooth sailing. The latest results from computer simulations are pointing to an alarming conclusion. Boeing's entire delta wing design may be fundamentally flawed. The Navy has refined its requirements and wants a more maneuverable plane that can carry more weapons. Boeing's delta wing design is now seriously overweight. Months into building the test planes, Boeing's lead engineers conclude that the only way to lose the pounds is to abandon the Delta and come up with a new wing and tail design. We are at a point in the uh, process here where we need to make a decision on the tail. I think we're really struggling with which way to go. An engineering team led by Dennis Mullenberg must come up with a new tail design that will work on a reconfigured fighter. The conventional choice is called a four-poster for its four control surfaces. The tail design for all modern U.S. fighters, including Lockheed's Raptor and its proposed JSF fighter. But there is an experimental alternative, a novel two-post tail with just two angled control surfaces. The Pelican tail is named after its inventor, an engineer inherited from McDonnell Douglas, Ralph Pelican. He argues its merits. Sure, I understand you're all nervous about uh, this new concept. I think it can be done. Proponents of the Pelican tail argue that the design is less visible to enemy radar. In other words, it has a smaller stealth signature. For Boeing, this is an important plus, since Lockheed is the originator and acknowledged master of stealth technology. We, we can't afford to have any question at all over our signature and whether, whether we're making a signature. I don't think that we really know enough about the Pelican tail. You know, we think we can make it work, but how much effort is ahead of us to make it work? Those supporting the traditional four-post tail argue it's a known quantity. The word on the street is that the JSF program managers favor it for the same reason. There's a slight benefit from a strategy standpoint that we can negate a perceived Lockheed advantage by going to a four-poster. On the other hand, we end up looking like the follower in, uh, with two teams that have the same design. I vote for the Pelican tail. I think we've got to bite the bullet and, uh, and go there. And I guess maybe I'm still a more conservative than Fred, and I would stick with the four-poster and try and get the signature to work with the airplane with a four-poster. But your probability of getting hit... The room is deeply divided. I'm talking about if you have a failure. In the end, Mullenberg must break the tie. Now, I've been a four-poster fan up until about an hour ago. <laughs> All right? I think we can beat the pants off Lockheed when it comes to work and weight, handling qualities, aerodynamics. Whether it's real or not, they're perceived to have a signature advantage. So we need to do something to our configuration that will give us a signature advantage. I think the Pelican tail does that, all right? Feeling so pressure to make a bold tail. choice, Mullenberg chooses the Pelican Nervous tail. About some things, so let's go figure out how to make it work. <laughs> but just days later, after Frank Statkiss and senior management review the choices, Boeing changes its mind. Concerned about weight and performance, it commits to the more conservative four-post tail. Is uh, signature versus weight the four-poster is a little safer way to go. Uh, so I was a little torn from a personal standpoint, but when we stood back and looked at the data, I think we made the right decision. Boeing radically changes the wing and tail design, which gives the proposed fighter a fresh new look. The new plane is projected to be 1,500 pounds lighter and more agile. But it's too late to incorporate the design changes into Boeing's two test planes now eight months into assembly. Instead, the company will submit the new configuration with its final proposal. By testing the new design in simulations and wind tunnels, 
and flight testing the old design, Boeing believes it can prove the soundness of its approach. To those of us watching JSF from the outside, this is the first sign that all is not well with the Boeing design. Both designs are evolving as the requirements evolve, but it seems that Boeing's design is not as adaptable as Lockheed's. The requirements are still evolving, so there must be concern within the government that Boeing's design can keep up. There was a lot to be made of the fact that their design was all screwed up and that they couldn't fly and they couldn't do this and they were behind and so forth. Not the case at all. To me, it was just an improvement in their design according to the requirements. It was very normal, very, very normal. Whatever the future holds for the redesign, at least one of Boeing's nightmares is finally over. George Bible's team has finished the troublesome wing skins and is ready to rush them from Seattle to California. The last pair of panels is loaded onto a C-5 Galaxy, the largest cargo jet in the Air Force. Boy, I hope the wind doesn't tip her wing over. <laughs> Bible scrapped the temperamental thermoplastic and cooked up the wing skins from a more conventional composite. Though heavier and less durable, the new wing coverings are finally on their way to Palmdale, still more or less on time and on budget. And that's just what happens when you're uh, reaching in technology. Sometimes you're successful and sometimes you're not. Emotionally, it'll be over for me when I see that airplane disappear over the horizon heading south. With the wing skins safely in Palmdale, Boeing wastes little time attaching them to the wing box. Whoa, hold it. But before the upper skin can be mated to the structure, critical wiring must be installed. Let's go terminate. A lone electrician crawls in between the skin and wing box to connect wiring. Working in the dark under the 700 pound wing skin is a grueling job. I'm gonna need a heat gun. Hour after hour, Doing good. Get it. Wire after wire. Each connection is tested and double checked. How you doing, Lonnie? Almost done. You almost done? Yeah. How many connections do you have to do? Two. He's been in there for four and a half hours. Has not come out yet. It's dedication. Now here he comes. Let's see if his leg's still moving. Lonnie, my man! You ready to clear, Jack? With the wiring done and the skin lowered into place, mechanics will spend the night hand tightening thousands of fasteners. Before the wing can be mated to the aircraft, another major piece must first be attached to the fuselage. Like a giant gift, the entire front end of the airplane arrives in the Phantom Works hangar. Now the work begins. <laughs> Here, believe my eyes. Oh, waited for all this time and finally got it. I can't wait to hook it up. <laughs> the front end, which includes the cockpit with all its intricate electronics, was built in St. Louis at a former McDonnell Douglas plant, now part of Boeing. We're back another three inches. But will this front end, built 1,800 miles away, made up with the rest of the fuselage? The fit must be as precise as the width of a human hair. If we bring this down a little further, uh, we'll, we'll get the flushness a little bit better. Yeah. Both up together. Bring it back just a little bit more. Bring it back about a half inch, and we're there. Looking real That's good. That's good. That's good. In less than two hours, the installation is complete and the Boeing X-Plane has its distinct face. It's starting to look like an airplane. That's what's really neat about it. You oh, guys no, are... I see a future contract. Yeah, well, that too. <laughs> With the addition of the one-piece wing, an apparition appears at the Phantom Works, the recognizable outline of the first of the Boeing X-Planes. The company is now weeks ahead of schedule, and morale couldn't be higher. It went great. Looks like an airplane now. Look at it. Lockheed, watch out. 
<laughs> what Lockheed is watching out for is an end to its crippling parts delay. You guys ready? Mechanics finally installed Bulkhead 270, okay, which took Go. five long months to carve out of titanium. No, 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 this way, this way. Ed Buer nervously waits to see if it will fit. If it does, a plane will quickly take shape go. around it. Yeah, we're all, we're if it here. doesn't, it's game over for Lockheed. Designed on the latest computers, cut with diamond tip bits, only to be installed with a sandbag. That is a beautiful piece of job. In the race to complete its X-planes, Lockheed still trails Boeing by months. But the manufacturing team plans to fly full throttle to the finish. Basically, this place is you know, populated by a bunch of airplane nuts, so it's a very high pace, and that pace is not going to slacken up at all. It's going to continue. To underscore its commanding lead over Lockheed, Boeing stages a public relations coup at the Phantom Works. In a surprise move, Boeing has assembled both of its test planes for the media event. Ladies and gentlemen, the X-32A and the X-32B concept demonstrator aircrafts what do you think? In an aerospace tradition called Rollout, the company shows off its brainchild in two different versions to the world. It's a moment of high emotion for Boeing program manager Frank Statkus. It's everything that we've done for the last three and a half years. It's all your successes. It's all your thoughts. It's all your weekend work. It's all your overtime. It's a soul that in that airplane because each and every one of us sweated bullets to put it there. Rollout is a milestone for the Boeing team. But as things stand now, Frank Statkiss with wings would get in the air faster than the X-planes. They may have soul, but they don't yet have brains. Hundreds of thousands of lines of vital software code is still under development to manage every function of the X-planes. That work gets tested here in a multi-million dollar simulator. Just yells in the wind gently. Boeing's lead test pilot, Fred Knox, puts the faux fighter through its paces. The crosswind, how about we uh, look at uh... Uh, 20 knots across wind, just give a little outside. Modern fighters are designed to be aerodynamically unstable. 10, roger that. Under computer control, that aerial volatility okay. transforms into acrobatic again. agility. Reset. Okay, you now have crosswinds. 10, 10, roger that. Every simulated flight by Knox helps refine this essential software. Flight control software controls the airplane the way it flies but it also turns on the air conditioner, it raises and lowers the landing gear, it uh, navigates for us, it does every critical element and every critical safety element in the airplane. If we haven't done the development here, the airplane will not fly. Touchdown. Yeah. But less than two months after rollout, the software development suddenly goes offline. Boeing is crippled by the largest white collar strike in American history. 17,000 aerospace engineers are off the job, including more than 100 developing the X-plane's flight controls. Progress inside the Boeing Phantom Works grinds to nearly a halt, while outside, a small group of engineers joins the strike. It's a bad situation for everybody. You know, everybody really has real mixed emotions, I think, and is real uh, conflicted about it. Forty days later, the strike ends, but Boeing doesn't escape unscathed. The strike on our program is a, is a terrible wound. We lost weeks of schedule. Those weeks will not be recovered. With the setbacks, Boeing's lead over Lockheed evaporates. 
After years of jousting back and forth,